Okay, it's my uh, distinct privilege to introduce Jiang Young Jia uh, and then a little bit of his history. I believe he originally graduated bachelor from uh, UFTC in yeah. Hefei, is that right? And then he went to New York, and ever since then he's been in New York. So he, he got his PhD at Stony Brook with a, uh, I'm guessing, with the physics department, and then Columbia, and he's a staff position at Brookhaven, and then he became a, a, a professor at us uh, back at Stony Brook. And um, the embarrassing thing about him is uh, is that he's a chemist, actually, in the chemistry department. But he's do I, you don't have any degrees in chemistry? No, no. So, only took a one course in chemistry in my entire life. <laughs> okay, but he's a professor of chemistry. Um, so uh, some of some of my best friends. So. Yeah. Um, anyway, so his uh, in, in the world of heavy ion physics, he's just he's been very diverse, despite the fact geographically everything he's done since coming here has been in New York, uh, physics wise. He's done uh, hard probe stuff, correlations, a lot of flow, uh, flow work, um, uh, chiromagnetic effect. Uh, you just you just name it, and, and he's done it. And one of the things I really appreciate about his work is that it's he doesn't just follow what everybody else is doing. When he works in flow, he does really cool stuff before he entering reaction planes and functional rapidity or correlating them, uh, which was uh, a lot of it was his idea. And because of a lot of this original work, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that he's a theorist. Uh, he is not. So please, uh, uh, so I'm trying to lower the expectations for you. That's why I want it. And so without trying to insult any more chemists or experimentalists, I will. I will Okay. Um, yeah, so this is my second time uh, I'm coming to uh, NSU. Um, I, first time in this room. Um, okay, so um, I want to talk about uh, this recent uh, idea that we uh, try to pursue. Um, it sounds very uh, ambitious, but that's the hope is that we look at the young collision. Typically, people say the picture is from left to right, right? So you start with something, that's your input, you, you measure the output, and you want to learn something in the middle, right? But what we actually want to do now, given that the fact that we have a very high precision measurement uh, in high energy hydraulic collisions, we were trying to make this connection. Okay? The multi-particle correlations in the final state and uh, the, the nature of the multinuclear correlations in the in the colliding uh, nuclei. So, uh, nuclear physics is a very broad field. Um, we are interested in um, the structure, the properties of the nuclear matter, and, and the different conditions. And this condition, you change by collisions, right? You change it. You, you vary the baryonic potential. All the the temperature of the, the matter, um, and then you explore this phase diagram. But the point is that <clears throat> all these experiment must start from the atomic nuclei, right? So this actually is the nuclear matter that we know the most, and we we have a lot of knowledge on this uh, atomic nuclei. And I, I don't know much about this. I just crop some pictures, uh, put it here. There's a lot of shapes. And the radio structure, right? For example, um, deformations, neutron scale, and stuff like that. Um, but what we try at the collision is to look at the long range collective feature of this uh, atomic nuclei. But that, I mean, is uh, uh, if I parameterize this with the Wood Saxon uh, function, I can talk about the shapes, portable. Uh, Taxality, optical and hexadecapole deformations, and also the radio distributions of the nucleons, uh, protons and neutrons, uh, which means uh, the, the looking at square radius and also the neutron scheme. So we take the atomic nuclei, right? So this is the starting point. 
and we accelerate them with very high energies up to uh, 100 or 1,000 uh, uh, times of the, the restness. So that means this object is highly uh, low risk contracting. They uh, pass through each other almost instantaneous, right? Very short time. And so uh, they produce the top one plasma, which, uh, which live uh, like 10 Fermi over C before the uh, uh, disintegrate into particles. So what you, if you look this is, in this very short amount of time, there's a, a huge particle production, right? You start with the 400 nucleons in the central collisions, and you end up with 30,000 particles if you integrate over the entire distance. So the, all of this is happens in this very short amount of time with a huge amount of particle production. So the key features that uh, facilitates the connection to the nuclear structure is these two points I want to make. The first is that this extremely short passing time means that the collision essentially take a snapshot, right? Of the nuclear and also the nuclear wave function, including all the protons inside uh, uh, in the overlap region. Okay, because there's no time for the for the protons and nucleons to move in this uh, in this uh, very short amount of time, and uh, also secondly, you produce huge amount of particles in the overlap region. That means the produced matter is very dense, and they expand hydrodynamically. Um, so I'm going to talk. This is the outline of my talk. So I think this this time, yeah. Of course. But doesn't that automatically mean you lost memory of the initial state? Your your <laughs> lost memory that depends on okay, you lose the you, you take a snapshot means you, you you don't have the full information of the initial state, but you still it's a collapse of wave function. You so you, you it carries the information of the wave function, right? In my opinion. So 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 I Maybe I actually can you ex explain what you mean by lost lost information? It means that uh, the things are rearranged and many particles are created, and every you know the energy is shared in such a way that you no longer have the snapshot. The snapshot is gone. Right, you lose the dynamics, in a sense, right? You, you but but the, the 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 consequence of the dynamics, in other words, the nuclear correlation and stuff, they tells you where the nucleons are when you take a snapshot, right? But of course, it, it doesn't tell you how you get there, I guess. I mean, because you can only take one snapshot, you cannot take two snapshots, right? You take one snapshot, you destroy it. You destroy the object entirely in order to make an image, but- So what do you mean by taking a snapshot? I think that's probably- Okay, so only, only, only in, a sense, in, in a sense where you put the, you, you deposit, the, you put the energy. Okay, but that's so, the final phase, right? That's the 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 uh the energy are deposited in the very beginning of the collision, and then the energy then be transported by hydrodynamics into the particles. So the energy deposition happens immediately here during the passing passing time. Okay. So okay, so I only take these three uh uh, slices, um, nuclear structure, initial causation at the t equal to zero plus time and the final state. And each of these you can describe using this uh, set of uh, uh, collective parameters, right? So you have uh, shapes, uh, regular structure from nuclei, nuclear, nuclear structure, and then the, the moments of the the, the initial conditions and also the moments of the momentum in the momentum space. Um, so, so what I do is that I need to talk about a few things. First, the hydrodynamics, <coughs> which connects the initial condition and the final state. <coughs> Second is the observables we use to describe the final state, and they will connect through the hydrodynamics the hydrodynamics back into this uh, uh, geomet geometrical picture of the initial condition. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, how to connect the nuclear structure with the initial condition. Uh, after that, I will 
take uh, one uh, uh, real uh, uh, experiment we did at the rig means also calculations and, and explain how to understand the data in terms of these connections. And then I will talk about the future prospects. So, so the hydrodynamics uh, is basically the equation that describes the energy momentum conservation. You cannot apply hydrodynamics everywhere you want, but very soon after the collision, the system hydrodynamics means uh, if you go to the local restaurant, you can talk about the energy density and the pressure, okay? And then plus perturbations, which is the, 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 the shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity. Okay, so the most important thing is this uh, energy density and the pressure, which are related by the equation of state. And these uh, corrections, this is the, only the first order, uh, these uh, corrections are proportional to the velocity uh, gradients, means the bigger is your velocity difference, uh, the bigger is your correction. So this is the shear and the bulk discussed this. And the system evolution is driven by the equation of state. So with these, uh, density gradients, okay? We generated this force to accelerate the matter, but this expansion will be resisted by viscosity. In other words, if you have a very large velocity difference, let's see in, in, in the different direction, this will lead to a reduction of the anisotropic flow. And it also reduces the, your radial expansion if you have a large bulk viscosity. So this is a, this tension between the expansion and, and the, the resistance to the expansion. So if we take a look at the initial foundation, uh, you in the overlap region, you have a bunch of nucleons. Um, they determine uh, the geometrical feature of this overlap region in terms of the volume, the size, the shape, right? So here we talk about the Italian language, we talk about uh, eccentricities. It's basically the multiple sh multiple shape uh, in putty in, in XY plane. You can see this is uh, really related to this uh, spherical harmonics that we all uh, live right uh, and love uh, in the nuclear structure. And then these are the moments of this describing this overall structure, which then through the hydrodynamics expansion translate into the momentum space. Uh, in a sense that if you have a if you have a large area, suppose you take a fixed amount of energy, you put this in the large area, this will lead to a, a small radial expansion because there's less smaller energy density. If you pack this energy into a more smaller area, you get a larger expansion. If you put this in the elliptic shape in the initial geometry, and then you end up with uh, an uncertainty in the momentum space, but the direction uh, is inverse and eh, reverse. So there's more momentum along this direction. Um, if you put this in a triangular shape, you will get a triangle uh, momentum distribution. So, so in other words, we cannot know everything about this you know, initial condition, but we can learn some, what we can learn is the moments, okay? You, you, have, you think about this part, the moments of this distribution, these moments can be translated into the final state using a linear response. Uh, picture, okay, which is of course is only the first order, but this has been established robust. Where you know uh, many many uh, theoretical calculations have shown that event by event basis that the number of charged particles is proportional to number of uh, participating nucleons. The radial flow fluctuations proportional to the the size fluctuation and the and such a flow is proportional to um, the eccentricity, at least for the first few orders, that's the case. And very important is this, this is, <clears throat> this is, you can only do this at very high energy because the particles are really dominated by the production, right? There's no, there's no stopping mechanism. I mean, it's, the stopping doesn't, it's not, it's not mixed with the, the expansion. And the large multiplicity, also allow you to determine this relation more precisely, okay? Oh, okay. So in the middle rapidity, 
okay, you have, you have this stretched circle here and they overlap, right? Okay, so, so you look at the nucleons. So this is the Dauber picture where you, you, if you look whether from projectile, which nucleon it has to be with, with the target. And those nucleons are participating nucleons in the projectile. You ask the same question for the target, right? And the sum of the nucleons from the projectile and target in this inactive region uh, are responsible for particle protection. Um, that's the that's the one of the nuclear model. <clears throat> but there is a time scale involved, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so before they get together, they interact. And the nucleons from be a target, you get excited. Okay, so this is not longer the ground state configuration. This is an excited state. Okay, in one nucleus and in another nucleus. And uh, while well, depending, of course, on details, you can find a blower and say, it's a blow kilometer arc. So if the system is excited sufficiently high energy, then it loses the memory, right? Of this okay, I, I see the, where the question is. Yeah. So, so there's a difference. That's why you go to high energy, because when you go to high energy, everything is a panty. Due to causality, they cannot talk to each other, right? Before they touch, the pancake touch each other because the whole thing become a really pancake and the, the, all the field are only lives on the transverse plane. And they do not, they do not know each other until they intact. In other words, the interaction time is very short because of the, the gamma factor. In the low energy, I, I imagine, I may say something stupid, okay? In low energy, Yes, they will, they, will, they will start to excite each other because they start to get close to each other. In the time of uh, passing, they will slowly modify your initial condition. And here we don't have this issue because of the Lorentz contraction. I don't know if this makes sense. The, the passing time at risk is two nuclei. They go by each other in 0 0.13 thermometer C. So the nucleons, the baryon number density does not change move transversely in the in that time. Yeah. So even by the time it thermalizes in half permeable C and it's really going to be hydro in that half permeable C they can't move very well. And of course in a minute all of C is too fast, right? Yeah. So it throws it freezes out the spatial distribution of variant density, but of course not of course like like you said the dynamics or the momentum information and everything else is completely in so you do the same you do the same with me as I find my view to try to extract the common between the functions by having very high beam stack. So the reason is the same. Yeah. The part of model is the same thing <clears throat> in a sense. Yeah. I have a, a different question, which is very briefly. How do you know the impact parameters? So you, you're telling me that you characterize this overlap region, the circle of each variant picture. Mm -hmm. But of course, we have. All impact parameters in our reaction. So how do, how do you know? How do you even how can you test? Okay. So the the point is that uh, we have a, you know, the number of particles produced is proportional to number of participants. So what we measure, I would say the the physical quantity is number of participating nu participating nucleus, not the impact parameter. Uh, in a sense, we actually Maybe maybe we shouldn't care about really about the impact parameter, right? Because the impact parameter is defined by the other nucleons, right? So we as long as we have a very good linear correlation. So how do we know there's a good linear correlation? Uh, we know this from models, but that's not good enough. So what do we know is that if you plot the number of charged particles in mid rapidity, for example, you take one rapidity slice, you take another rapidity slice. You take another rapid slice all the way to go to forward. You correlate them. It's absolutely diagonal, very narrow. Okay. So, so we based on that, we know it's a global geometry which drives the particle production. And of course, uh, direct correlating with the end part, we still need a, a, a model to, to do that. So now um Here's another thing. Do we see the feature of the radio flow and the liquid flow 
uh, of course, the reactive steam, because if you change the centrality, your, your system become more dense and you see the mean heat increases uh, towards more central collision, or you look at the inductive flow where you go from central to critical, you can see that because of the electricity, the system become more electric, it drives bigger electric flow. And so what this, uh, this is really like very early data, but 20, almost 20 years ago, uh, there's much better measurement, which I'm going to show you in a minute. The point is that in order to produce this uh, radio flow and electric flow in extremely short amount of time, the system must have very strong interaction. That means the, the mean free pass compared to the system size much is very small. That that is really you need a lot of particles. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, you do not want large viscosity because because the system lives very short of time, that means the velocity gradient is free. The sigma mu mu is very large. That means epsilon uh, eta must be small in order to have a not so big viscous correction, you know, which will destroy your flow. Okay. And this is the reason why we get this, uh, this uh, very small little glass which we claim is perfect fluid because of this tension between these two, uh, two driving um, forces. And um, just like the uh, cosmic microwave background, we actually can measure the anisotropy power spectrum, right? So we measure the Vn as function of A. Um, but we, what we have here is that this spectrum is reflecting the initial condition. If you believe the, the linear re response relation I was talking about earlier, what is good about the Hebeian collision in this high energy is that since you have so many collisions, each of them have a different nature of fluctuation, we're not only talking about the mean value, but also the, uh, the probability uh, density function of each harmonics, as well as the correlations between them, okay? So, so we actually measure the, the probability distribution of these flow harmonics, event by event. And so the way we do it is to build up this uh, uh, two-point correlation function, three-point correlation function, multi-particle correlation function, which is simply the moments of one particular moment of this entire PDF. And by getting information on these uh, moments, uh, we basically can uh, relate to the initial uh, volume size and shape event by event information in the initial condition. We're not in the nuclear structure yet. So here is just uh, <clears throat> show you a view of uh, these observables. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, the, the, this is an event by event point. Okay? So this is a probability distribution of uh, one particular harmonics or the correlation between the phases of uh, the three plane correlations or correlations between two harmonics and uh, just the uh, single harmonics all the way to V6 as function of centrality, correlation between the uh, mean transverse momentum and the, and the flow harmonics, or simply the PD fluctuation. There are many, many such uh, measurements, which I don't spend any time on it. Uh, so, but I want to go to this uh, important point is that how do we make use of all these data? Uh, the approach we are taking right now uh, in the community is to use the three, uh, well, uh, hydrodynamics model, single bar hydrodynamic model, uh, times the, plus the Bayesian uh, inference approach to maximize the constraining power of the flow and all the other data that you thought actually uh, tried to pioneer uh, seven years ago. Um, <clears throat> so, but there's a challenge. The challenge is that uh, there are many parameters. There's uh, already, a lot of parameters coming from initial condition. There's also a lot of parameters which you want to learn about, like a shear bulk viscosity is the parameter you really want to know, but you also need to know you don't have a direct input on the initial condition parameters. How do you deposit the energy, for example? And this, this parameter are entangled. That means when you look at the extraction of the bulk and shear viscosity, you get a large uncertainty, okay? It's, you are no longer limited by the data itself. It's really because you don't know the nature of the correlation between the parameters. 
And that's why the motivation for me is initially was not to study the, the nuclear structure, but try to see if we can learn better about the initial condition. Okay. So the current approach is that <clears throat> you take the heavy ion observables, you constrain hydrodynamics and the initial condition. My goal here is that it's also to use the nuclear structure as an input coming from the left hand side and vary and change this nuclear structure and see what happens to the initial condition. So provide uh, almost independent constraint of this, uh, this initial condition. That's my motivation. Yes. That's, so aerodynamics will be also fluctuating. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you, and it will be fluctuating like the, the nonlinear manner, depending on how initial conditions, generally structure conditions. Factors. So, how do you separate? How do you plan to separate the fluctuations in the aerodynamics from fluctuations in this structure? Because only then you can get some mapping. <clears throat> you mean how do I divide the initial condition yeah, from final state? What happens with time after the contact? Okay. What <clears throat> but that's a that's a very challenging question because uh, many people are devoted to study the so-called hydrodynamization. How the system reaches condition where you can use hydrodynamics to describe it. And first of all, that time is very short <clears throat> because otherwise you will not be able to get the large flows. That means that time is smaller than 0 0.3 from the OSC. You put the hope by that time, <clears throat> your energy density still remains roughly the same. Uh, but but that, that is a good question. I, I, I believe, I have my own personal opinion, okay, which we can discuss separately okay. yeah, on this. But it's indeed is one of the sticking points, I would say. Okay, <clears throat> how the initial condition responds to the nuclear structure? Uh, I will take one example here. Just take the bottom core deformation and take a look at the, the ultra central collision, head on collision. In order to have head on collision, you can arrange this in different ways, right? So make sure they have a maximum overlap. <clears throat> We either have a body body collision, this is the whole initial condition look like, or tip tip, how this look like, or somewhere in between. And you can immediately see that if you write a um, make it model calculation, this is how much eccentricity you get, right? It's directly proportional to the deformation. However, of course, in general, <clears throat> you can just simply use a, a Taylor expansion argument, okay? So the leading order contribution is always small must be proportional to beta 2 with a factor that it depends on the orientation of this colliding nuclei and also interparameter. And so the epsilon zero here, so it's not actually we call it epsilon zero, is the fact that you, even the system is undeformed, you have some baseline there. Okay? And so that's all I need. I take this, this epsilon is a vector, right? It's a blue vector. And you do a two particle correlation this is the experimental observer, right? So something you measure correspond to experimental level to measure. You average all, all possible air orientations. What you get is that you get a, a beta two square term naturally with a coefficient here. It just simply is average over the phase space. Okay, and we know the V two is proportional to epsilon two. That's how the beta two enters to the V two measurement. Okay. Hi. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say everything was pancake stable? Yes. So, so I shouldn't draw this as like this. It should be pancake. First you rotate it, then you put in you project in the XY plane. Yeah. Oh, so you get high density depending on the yes, yes, yes. All of this should be pancakes, yeah. But what about this impact parameter? <clears throat> mm -hmm. When we get two pancakes, yes. You know, it will be look deeper yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why uh, the, 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 the <clears throat> they were mixed. So in other words, it, it, of course, you have different orientation, also different parameter. In the end, you plot a probability distribution of the input participant nucleus. You slice on that, you see how they correlate, how they select, how well they select the, the geometry. I, I'm just arguing, uh, I'm just uh, saying, right? Based on very general argument, your tele expansion must look like this. There's no other way. Leading orders 
is proportional to the beta two, and you can confirm this. This is true in in, in all the models. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you can integrate over all the parameters, and you still get a surviving beta two. Where yeah, yeah. but uh, we don't want to we don't want to integrate the web in power parameter. We want to sle select really want to sl uh, slice on this in power parameters. But you're gonna build experiment. Yeah, yeah. We slice on the end part. Okay, we cut on the number charge particle. The point is that you really want to maximize the the powers. You want to look different centrality. By centrality, I mean different number charge particles. We pick up different or different geometry. Okay. So you assume that you have reactions involving identical, that your projectile and beam are the same. Mm -hmm. Neutrons, right? Yeah, yeah. By both and both, mm -hmm. left and right. Mm -hmm. But you also have quantum mechanical yes. shape vibration. Yes, yes. So the neutron does not have a well yes. defined mm -hmm. project shape, right? Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. So what happens is that <clears throat> the fluctuation will interfere. Just like a sigma beta square. <clears throat> it just add on. The virus just add on the square of the mean. You don't measure epsilon, measure epsilon square. Yeah. So, yeah. So all the fluctuations should contribute. And when you have spherical nuclei, you still have flow. It's still not zero. Itself. In the non central collision. Yeah. Because of the overlap region, also have a shape. But this is this, 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 this kind of here. This, this really are a dominating signal in most of the centrality, which are, which are enhanced by the deformation. Yeah. Okay, so we, I can <clears throat> then expand this argument to other deformations. If you run a global model simulation or some analytical calculation, you will see that it turns out well, I, I first of all, you know, I use this relation, okay, to make an argument that we feel actually also influenced by the optical definition. You, you, you see, you, you line up the two pair, uh, two, two triangle, and, and, and you, you, you see if you pick up large eccentricity, you also have a preference for the, the beta three. And so this will contribute. And the way three, on the other hand, is only coming from beta, beta three. And turns out <clears throat> the size fluctuation, which is the main degree fluctuation, because of the, the size is also at this portable term here. And uh, wait, did I write this right? Should we square root? No, no, no. no. Uh, okay. It's a second, what? So you project everything on the XY plane. Okay. So, so you just say, okay, I take all the nucleons, I calculate their x, x square plus y square. That's my R curve. I should write R curve. Okay. And then you're weighted by the angular distribution because that's the, that's the moments I'm looking. Okay. So, so I'm sorry, this, this may not have this, just R square. But this second moments, that means this uh, EPD fluctuation also, also have a contribution of beta to beta C. It's quite easy to verify this. Use an analytical uh, calculation with the liquid drop model. Now, <clears throat> well, let's, how about other parameters? How about the, the A0 and R, right? The radius and the diffuseness parameter of the loop section. It turns out it doesn't do anything in the, in the central collision, but in the mid central collision, it plays a big role. Why? Because in the mid central collision, if you have a small A0, that means the overlap region is, is more compact. If they have a sharper surface, naturally it will produce larger, larger width one, larger mean two. Okay. And uh, and also if you change the radius, if you reduce the radius for the same end part, this means you also increase, right? It's just simply the simple picture I, I showed you earlier. So just, just naive expectation, okay? And one of the difference that uh, I want to point out is that from the low energy, let's see, method, is that in low energy, you take one nucleus, you don't, dis I mean, sometimes you do destroy it. In the E collision, electron ion collision, you just probe one location or some short range correlation, right? You don't, you don't probe the entire nucleus. 
in chimeric combination, by destroying the entire nucleus, you actually probe in the entire nucleus. Okay, you you probe the entire mass distribution in the overlap region, and you can build up multi-point correlations because each collision produces thousands of particles. You have in term in terms of the information, each collision you have many much more information than what you you can get in any other experiment. Okay. You, you just have so many particles coming out, coming out of this overlap region, you can do you can do multi-particle correlations. So I don't quite understand this argument because if we do full of excitation, if we do on the gold target or on the net target, mm -hmm. the excitation happens in the full of fields of all photons involved. So we are not probing one photon. Sure. So I don't think that's correct. I mean, we are only looking at, at the electron induced reactions. Um, in where I took science, we have no electron That's right. I, also, if you think about charge breakers, right, mm -hmm. they are very precisely measured using atomic physics techniques. Yes. Um, where the many body systems participants. And yes. So I don't think it's, it's quite fair to say in our techniques we are only probing one sure. nu nuclear electron. Yeah. Right. I try try to contrast the difference. That's the only thing I'm trying to say. In the Coulomb excitation, all the I guess all the protons are they behave collectively, right? The excitation is a collective excitation. <clears throat> so, so I what I want to do is just find out uh, there there's still a difference between between what you you do at high energy and low energy. The question is, are you probing the same information or not? Okay. So that's the interest question. I'm I'm I think it's a really interesting that we should uh, try to address. So now, not only we can measure the mean and the variance, now we can talk about the sternness and the ketosis, which are the three particle and the four particle correlation. If you, you can construct these moments, you can find the corresponding observers in the final state. And so the particularly the sternness here, which I think we discussed briefly, is that <clears throat> the, the, the flow PT correlation allows you to probe the trisality. Okay? Um, so we go to the Oster bar collisions at the rig. Uh, we have all those same Zaturian collisions. Uh, and then, so the original goal for this uh, program is to search for the parallel magnetic effects. Uh, but uh, turns out uh, we didn't find it. And, but we found something else. Basically, like there's quite a large difference between the two uh, species, which uh, can be seen uh, coming from the nuclear structure difference. And so the way we do it is that <clears throat> the, the running is done like field by field, we switch the species. We keep the identical luminosity. The experimental running con detector condition is the same. There's very little fluctuation. And so there's almost, I mean, all the, the precision are really uh, only limited by the statistics, okay? And, and so, so we can, because this measurement is very precise, maybe, we can think about imaging. <clears throat> and so the question we ask is that, uh, this has been asked many times by uh, low energy people as well, is that if you have observable, you make a ratio between Rosinim and Dacconi as function of centrality. And if this ratio is not equal to one, what does this mean, right? So the only way we can explain it is that first, it must originate from the nuclear structure difference. Uh, which impact uh, impacts the initial state and survives to the final state. And so the okay, so there's out of order, but so again, use my uh, argument of uh, this tele expansion. I take a simple observable, single particle, two particle observables. You can show analytically that the linear order. We have a small deformation; it comes in like a square. And of course, it also depends on the radius and the, the surface thickness. And I write it, expand it around some reference value, okay? And so if you use these two equations, you take the ratio, you will see that there are four terms. There's contribution from beta two, contribution from beta three, contribution from the radius difference and the A difference. And these four terms, if you only take the leading order term, there's no mixing, okay? They're independent. And also, this means you can only probe the differences between the other bars. 
you not you will never learn the the actual individual value. Okay. And so um, now if you can somehow manage to get this third R and third A, you could then try to relate to the neutron scale if you know the charge contribution. Now we if you determine experimentally the mass contribution. Many people use this method, right, in the low energy. So I, I, we are not attempting to do that, but just point out this, this possibility. So the input for this Lucian acronym, I take uh, here, for example, just take the e, PE2 and PE3 value and do a simple conversion into the corresponding data two and data three. Turns out that there's a large, uh, you know, a PE3 uh, transition uh, rate uh, for the zirconium, which if I do a simple uh, conversion, I can get this one is at least 0 0.2, okay? Why is large? I don't know, I just do the conversion is pretty large. And of course, the Hume and the larger have larger scale because it's more neutron rich, therefore the ADO is bigger and the radius is a little bit smaller. So I can calculate all these things. Another question is, can we use these four numbers try to explain the data, okay? Um, let me first show you how the data look like. Uh, there are many more, so I'm only showing you a, 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 a three observables here. So that you can see there's a ratio of the charge particle distribution, the ratio of the NPD is a single single particle observables. There's a list of two particle observables, let's see the V2, V3 ratio, uh, PD variance fluctuation ratio in black. We also have three particle observables, okay? So many of them. Um, <clears throat> The first impression you will see is that this ratio is not one. And the, the, the ratio is a strongly dependent, centrality dependent, okay? That the, they, they look different from each other. Okay, so, so the central collision typically have always had large distinctions, but except the mean PT. Um, so now let me just pick uh, 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 a few examples and see if we can explain them. Um, let's let me first take the V two ratio. Okay, so it's a would be square ratio of the V two and the V three as part of a centrality here. What you see is that V two ratio, lucidium over the queen first goes up, then goes down, then goes up. V three just goes down like this. Okay. Now I take the one uh, simple transport model calculation, the so called the AMPT, but recently people also did this in hydro. Almost qualitatively, they see the same thing. Um, now, if I only include the beta 2, the particle deformation, you see that V3 is not movement. Okay? The ratio is the same, but the V2, you get the enhancement because of the large uh, beta 2 form of C, so it just goes up like that. Now, if I only also consider the beta 3, now the beta three appears in the in the zirconium, which is in the denominator, which in fact is the V two of the zirconium. So therefore, the ratio decreases, and the V three uh, ratio is uh, already uh, matched, right? I only consider beta three. Now I can also consider the difference in the skin. Uh, lucidium is sharper. Lucidium is have a sharper surface, therefore it have a larger V2. And this push up is up, up. And you always get this S wave shape, right? S shape behavior. It doesn't do much on the on the on the on the on the V3, it increased by about 1%. But if I then consider the radius also differ by 1%, this goes down a little bit, right? Because larger radius means smaller signal, goes down a little bit, and this goes back down like this. Okay. Qualitatively, I can explain this. The entire centrality depends on using these four parameters. Yes. Just a question. Every time you see additional physics, does it mean that you have additional parameters or, or are you trying to fix these parameters to the realistic beta two, the realistic beta three, whatever? I mean, are, are these independent, independently constrained or does it just mean that you model? A, a model add one by one. So in other words, if I only consider beta two, the zirconium, all the other parameters using the Lucidian parameters, I introduce the difference one by one. And still in the last but step, I really- But you prefer the parameter that you yes. allow to, to vary. Oh, no, no, here it's fixed. 
I already fixed to this value. You fixed it to whatever we know to yeah. be the realistic yes. quantity that we Yes, have. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the delta A and the delta R, those are parameters, but you don't know what they are. Um, yes, I know it from TFT. Um, so, so here, I, I was name, I need this, definitely need this. So Muslim have a, have a um, sharper, smaller A0. So when I see I introduce, include the A0, what I mean is that I introduce these inputs. By default, I'm using new components. But when I say I enable this, I mean I include these inputs. So where did you get from these inputs? Oh, this number I got from which one? Um, so basically they did, uh, well, it's, it's, a, um, it's a DFT, it's a, uh, I think it's a, Calculate for SLY4, DFT calculation, and that's what we got. But I also did the calculation. If I use different model, this difference is almost the same. The value may change, but but actually the value doesn't matter because of this, right? It's only the difference. So all of these additional parameters are constrained independently. Yeah. Not with the data that you are working with. Yeah, but the, I could argue. It's it, quite impressive. I, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. impressed that, yeah. that you're getting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But TFT is in a zero range theory. Yeah, smear theory. Yeah. Depends on the range. So it's just. What, what do you mean by range? I mean, the decision is the same. Depends yeah. on the range of the interaction. Yeah. If you get it from the theory, it says no range. So it's a mean theory. Yeah. Yeah. But even the electron scattering experiment thing is lovely. Particularly when you have a deformed you don't know whether you're looking at coverage safe or. Can you extract the nuclear structure parameter from the heavy atom? Yeah, I, I, I believe so. I, I will show you. Um, I, will, I, will, I, will, I think so, but I need to be cautious. Yeah. So this one makes sense. So C1, C2, C3, C4, half this. Yeah, no. no, 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 no. This I don't know. I, I mean, this is a perfect explanation. I can, I can, I can determine this using a given model. Let's see, I run MPP. I know precisely what this looks like. I, I don't. I, in the back of a, a plot, I it, you will see how the these are function of neutrality. They have different shapes. So it's a response. Uh, yeah, it's a response to the. Then the data you find is the next slide. You find is Oh no, I didn't do any calibration. I didn't do any calibration. But because this is going to change as you change the x value. Yeah, 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 exactly. But you calculate those. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, no, no. I don't need it. I don't need it. Yeah. So may I ask you, uh, go back to the previous. Oh, yeah, yeah. What is this AMPP? Oh, it's a, um, a, mo uh, a multi phase uh, transport model. It's developed by Chunin Ko and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Zivi Lin. Uh, so basically, this model is uh, uh, is a so-called. It start with uh, uh, hygiene initial conditions, apply stream melting to all the hydrons are, are convert into quarks, and then you do quark transport, and then you do a coalescence after that, then hydronic rescattering. So then, what you're saying is you're saying that AMPC mm -hmm. uh, calculation, the initial the initial nuclei, you can change it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I can, I can figure, I can implement the wood structure with all the deformation and all this video structure. As an input, I modify the code to put this in here. I mean, the, the business, for example, would be different for neutrons for protons. It, it, it turns out, for, of course, there's no other speed, but it doesn't matter. We, I just take the average. You just take the average. Yeah, I check, it's there's no good. It's, it's not, I mean, it's good that you have sensitivity, but mm -hmm. the, the fact that you're Describing data is disturbing. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I would say disturbing. 
<laughs> we need to understand why. Yeah. How will discussion about No, no, I think not. So, so let's look at uh, another one, which is the simple particle of the okay? so this is simply the multiplicity distribution. I think I have to show you one. Multiplicity goes like this, right? Yeah, like this mean and I think I show this, but I think the multiplicity distribution, I mean TP. Okay, so let's look at this multiplicity. I look this black box, this the data. You have this very broad bound in the mid-center population, followed by a rise, steep rise in the center of place. Now I put in the deformation. So I put in deformation, which is shown by the red and the black. That's uh, a red and blue. You see, it doesn't do anything in the mid central collision. Deformation doesn't do anything in the mid central collision. It starts to play a role when your multiplicity start to rapidly fall. Okay, so that's strong translation between beta two and beta three. What is responsible for this right, this bump here is beca because of the the, the, the radio structure, right? You can imagine if you if you uh, change the radio structure, let's say reduce uh, reduce the the, the surface, uh, reduce the skin, the system become more compact. It turns out you have like a few percent more probability to get mid central events to produce mid central events. Okay, it's a simple geometric effect, and this is very robust. You can capture this. You see a zero. Uh, in high ratio, but then it took the R. You remember the R here? It further increases. I can describe this shape. Um, here, I did a little bit skinny, okay? So I, I did a change a little bit. I rescaled my AAPT calculation horizontally by 6%, okay? Because I said, I don't know the particle. I don't know how well AAPT describes the particle production. So I put in 5%, 6% horizontal skinny. Uh, why oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so this is this is the P and this charge particle. And we know this on the log scale, it always go like this, right? Yes. Yeah, that's that's the ratio of the PN is the probability of how many events appears in this region. This region, so this tell you there's two percent more events. Such events uh, for the for the receiving <coughs> collision. So now I can also look the mean PP, but uh, AMPT is wrong. <laughs> it uh, it does not describe the mean PP uh, value, so it has the wrong physics. But it turns out that I can still look the qualitative behavior. I took the ratio of the mean PP. What I see is that deformation doesn't do many doesn't do much here. What happens is that if we increase the A. Okay, so decrease the A, which is the Rossini. You get a larger VPP because of, there's more radio expansion, which is compensated by if you use a larger radius, it goes back down. So there's a calculation. So the point is that this adds up for the multiplicity and the casual, casual for this. So in a sense, we, the data have a lot of information that can determine, uh, I think I'll give you some in insight on the features associated with each of the, each parameters, okay? So I think that, you know, I mean, there are models, by the way, there are models, how do model that, which are able to describe this, okay? Uh, but you have no data on this, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, because I said it does not describe the data. Yeah, MMPT doesn't, it, it doesn't describe, MPT model is not correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then a uh, very important question is that I check whether this ratio is robust against the variation in the final state parameters. In other words, I can change the whole structure, the shear viscosity, right? I can check ch change the shear viscosity. I can I can change the how much uh, the strength of hydronic rescattering. So I can vary the V2 and V3 by a lot. However, the ratio remains very robust. This feature is just there. Okay, so that means. I can almost cross all the final state and push it to very close to the initial condition. So this ratio allow you to isolate the initial condition. Why this is important? It's important because experimentally we measure this also by ratio. Suppose I talk to Vitek, okay? Tell me what is the 
beta two, beta three are the A value I get it from you. I plug in, I will be able to directly calculate this this C1, C2, C3, C4. Right? What this what this means is that this is the response to equation that connects me to the structure of my initial condition. Once they are determined, I can use that to make a predictions because D only depends on the CC size and well story. Okay. And I can use it to test all these different initial conditions for you deposit the energy to produce initial conditions. This is I know we have the information. So that's where this application can be. And but how do we do that more systematically? Um the point is the following. <clears throat> the in, any flow of double is some response convoluted with some initial condition. And the nuclear structure, they are now on the atomic function of the neutron number and the proton number, right? However, in Italian collisions, this response is very smooth function of the mass number. Actually, very slowly change, very slowly change. Okay, that means we can choose the species with the same response, but dramatically different structure. That's the handle you're going to have. And one example I give you here is the Let's see, uh, I'll pick a Samarian at the top. We have eight stable species going from almost critical to more deformed than really, right? And what uh, the mass number only changed by 7%. That means the, the, the hydro response changed much less than 7%. Okay? And what I do is that, for example, this relation between my initial causation and deformation only have two parameters. In the central collision, the eccentricity is actually only coming from a simple position of the random uncorrelated nucleus. It, we know it's still like one over eight. So that means if I, but the B is only geometrical, it's an independent system. So for any species, I can draw a line with the intercept and the slope. The slope is almost the same. The intercept differ by a little. So I can put the two species to determine the slope and the intercept. I can make predictions of contrast the consistency with the nuclear structure prediction. All right, so this is how we could use it. Okay, so it can be used to check consistency. If they are not the same, you would ask, okay, maybe in high in collision, you produce a different, you probably a different nature of the nuclear structure. Okay, that would be an interesting question. And we apply this, uh, which I've been to skip. Another important thing is that track salary. Traxality is very hard to measure, right? Based on my limited knowledge, it's not an easy thing to access. But you only need a three point correlator because there are three axes which are different. How do you see three axes that are different? Well, you build a three point correlation. You immediately see in the leading order, there is a traxality contribution because you are doing three point correlation in the same event. And this is the leading order with the negative sign. If you do a PP, uh, student is positive sign, coefficient is different. And, and then we see, look the data, we do see that. Here is a comparison between uranium and the gold. Uranium is highly correlatively deformed, right? We know that. And that means it's cosine three gamma is equal to one. You should have a negative contribution here. Compared to gold, we see huge reduction. This changes sign. And for the PP students, we see a huge enhancement because there's a positive contribution. It was very clearly seen in the heavy on data. And what this means is that we can combine, let's see, for example, the three particle correlation, which give you access to gamma and beta, two particle correlation, which only have access to beta, is insensitive to beta. You can add it to gamma, you can check. Traxality does not, you, two particle correlation cannot prove. Uh, track salinity. So, so that means you can use these two, two observables. You can you can use the we we two PP correlation and we two to map whatever trajectory on this side to a, another trajectory on the heavy other side. I mean, of course, take some work to. You need to know the coefficient. Once you know the coefficient, you can make make a prediction. One last thing. It was mentioned that fluctuation is important. Um, <clears throat> so in Atlas, which is this work I was involved uh, at least for my group, we measured the three-part correlation between the uh, Dina 129 and less 208, 
to make the ratio, we see the ratio of this correlator is almost flat, flat as far as entirety. We compare with <clears throat> uh, calculations with different gamma for the uh, for the for the for You see here like this, right? A type of preference for certain degree. However, it, it can also be consistent with the average between correlate and obvious, right? I, if I average this two, I also get this. I cannot tell whether it's a stable triaxial, a static triaxial, or a fluctuation. And so this is a, this is a, you know, and of course there's also shape resistance. I think the one of the interesting uh, thing we can do is that we can make up a correlator which does something like similar to this order three values because those are intrinsically two particle correlation, four particle, this is four particle, three particle, and six particle, right? I can make up something that allow you to probe this. And so, okay, I think I put every sample. This four particle probe the beta two, four particle probe the beta four means it's post moment means it's high order fluctuation. I could in principle combine these two to separate the mean and the variance, okay? Same is true for the for this this guy, which is three particle correlation, this six particle correlation. <clears throat> in stars, very difficult to do. In star, we don't produce enough particles. In large hydron collider, we can produce many, many more particles in a much bigger acceptance. So all those correlations will become possible. And so that's why I will continue to go to the, the higher energy. And so let me go to my summary, which I don't need to, to read. <laughs> Um, I will just point out the, a lot of work I needed to form up this case. I mean, especially interest from the nuclear structure people, and uh, it's important. I'll draw your attention to this IEP program. Uh, the deadline is passed, but it, there will be a, a workshop so people can participate remotely. Remember, in this year, so if you have any questions, ask the dean, we will explain to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how about one more question from anybody? If you already had about fifteen, yeah. okay. And I'll put on it. Go ahead, Paul. You, you go there in the uh, in this ratio to I think is the fifth thing that there is some right now. How can you ensure that there is no difference between even the deeds that the accelerator provides? Yeah. So the <clears throat> the energy of the beam is uh, controlled uh, within. A few MeVs. I don't remember. It's a few like I don't remember, but it's ten to minus four. Okay. Okay. So now, no, no, no. We know that if you change the energy by factor two, your particle production only change by twenty percent. Right, but there may be other like what I mentioned. I know. Okay. So the way we know it is because um, remember we measure the. Any observable as function of run number, mm -hmm. the run is automated. And we see how stable is the difference as function of run number. They really take a two bands and the fluctuation, there's no there's no systematic difference. Yeah. Okay, so uh Yang Yang will be around through all tomorrow also. So uh yeah. when we get on a schedule, uh, uh Dr. Sheelan and the people that are going to go to dinner like and tomorrow, tomorrow night. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again. Mm -hmm.